Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be doing the I'm So Annoyed tag, which was created by Kelly at Books I'm Not Reading. I haven't done a video in a while. I've been really swamped with like researching and writing my blog posts for March and April, but I'm, you know, ready to do some videos today. And so the first dumb question is, do publishers ever do things that you find annoying? Share an example. Well, I'm not fond of covers plastered with excerpts from reviews, like images of award. The book is one, like, for example, Newberry or like whatever, a Caldecott, things like that, Sydney Taylor Book Award or announcements of a film or TV show based on it. Like, for example, now a major motion picture or being made into an awesome upcoming TV show on HBO, you know, like that. Using a picture of the actors on a later edition also generally annoys me unless it's like, you know, for the quintessential example, it's like Gone with the Wind where just about everyone mentally sees the characters as the actors who play them. I mean, kind of, it, it feels almost wrong to have any other book cover. Like, you know, that's just the people just imagine Scarlet and Rhett as, you know, Clark, um, Gable and Vivian Lee, like, like, who doesn't see them like that? But like, other than that, it's, it's just kind of annoying. Like, is this really about the book or are you just trying to drum up more marketing for the TV show or the film? And I also hate bad formatting with words practic practically falling into the gutter, especially in mass market paperbacks. That requires having to break the spine and squint at the print. It's not very comfortable on the eyes or hands. And speaking of, books over a certain length don't work as mass market paperbacks because the page count automatically breaks the spine and often causes pages to start getting loose and falling out. Six by nine is the standard trim size for saga length books for a reason, and exceptionally long books benefit from a larger size like um, seven by 10. I will just um pull, I should have done this before the video started, pull a book off of the shelf, which has the above mentioned like words practically falling into the gutter. So this is one of my all-time favorite books, The Decameron, although I hate the story illustrating it, one of the few stories I don't like. But anyway, you can see how, like, tiny the margins are. And, it is, and it's not, like, so much that this is, like, a bad, like, more inner margin size necessarily, but it's just the longer a book is, the more and more it shrinks as it, like, gets towards the end of the book. So it's maybe not so bad for the first maybe, like, 100 or 200 or so pages, but you see but past page 400, like, look at it like this and by the time you get to the end it's like you're just like shrinking and I'm shrinking up so that's just really annoying and this is another example I got this from Mr. K's bookstore um David Copperfield this I would guess it looks maybe like a five by eight-ish trim but just just look at this it's really like hard to open it like you have to like pull and tug and that necessitates breaking the spine so this is just a you know a terrible terrible like trim size for a book like that and this is um don quixote which again look at this tiny little print and the words just like falling into the gutter you should your margins inner margin size should be at least like 0.8 inches for a really really long book but ideally one inch is like even better it's so much easier on the eyes and did i pull down no those were the only books which i um, pulled down but i also like pulled out my own books which i had published to just see the lesson because i came out with later editions of all of these books in um hardcover as well as like adding a little it wasn't too many changes just like a few like new passages and like just tweaks here and there it wasn't like major changes at all but I you know realized myself look at this like print in the inner size margins when I added about like the inch inner margins and the page length increased by about a hundred pages but it was like so much easier on the eyes and I did like read through this all this is this is more of like an arc copy than the actual like finished product because there were still, you know, a couple of, you know, changes I had to make. But, you know, well, I was able to read through, like, it, as the more and more you read on, the more, like, you know, un uncomfortable and it gets in the middle. And so this is, like, one of my other books, which I published at, like, 7.10. This is a trim size, which I really do recommend. I wish more people would use this for, like, saga length books when it's above a certain length. This is just so much easier to hold in this length and it's easier to, you know, look at and the inner margin size is like bad. well the inner margin size I it, I made a mistake it was kind of stupid the inner margin size I used was 0.7 inches I meant to put like 0.8 but you know lesson learned we all learn from our mistakes and so you know this is just you know I wish just wish more people would like know about formatting just what works in a mass market paperback or what people were okay with you know like 
50, 30 years ago. That's not necessarily what, you know, people want or like these days. Question number two, have you ever been annoyed by a spoiler? Even something as simple as someone else telling you there's a great twist. I stopped reading introduction, e introductions years ago because they almost always seem to give away the ending in pivotal plot developments. Like, seriously, why should I be motivated to read the book when everything's already been spoiled? I also hated Wishbone, a PBS show my little brother used to watch back in the, like, 96, 95, because they gave away the entire plots of so many classic works of literature I'd been looking forward to reading. To this day, I still haven't read some of them, but in part because I already know what happens and won't have the joy of discovering it, it on my own for the very first time. This was, you know, like back in the day before everyone had their own TV set in a house. So like there was no choice. It was on during dinner and I was watching. I was so, I was so angry at the show at 16 years old. How dare you like ruin the ending? Why can't you just tell the kids, the target audience, oh, this is what generally happens. Oh, and to find out like if name and name ever get together or like name like finds out the truth or gets revenge or like whatever the main story is like oh you have to read the book when you're old enough instead of oh just spoil it all oh I hated that show so much and they just like kept watching it I hated the stupid dog too <laughs> I found the whole premise of the book thief which I did a recent video on based on my one of my most viewed blog posts of all time I found it annoying and gimmicky, but since the narrator constantly horns into the narrative to obnoxiously give away pivotal plot developments and the ending while smirking about how clever he is and how we'll never see that one coming, like, seriously, like, newsflash, this book sucks. And it also kind of reminds me, I know this is kind of dating myself, that you remember that episode of The Simpsons from, like, I think it's probably 30 plus years ago at this point where... Mo is acting on a soap opera and he's like really angry. He gets fired. So he sneaks back onto the set playing the angel of the future. And he's giving away a whole year's worth of plot developments. Like nobody likes that in a TV show or a book. So like, just don't do it. And another thing that was spoilery that I don't like, well, I used to write in old fashioned God mode my, myself since I saw it modeled in so many of the old books I read but it now makes me cringe, particularly when I see it in modern books, like, wh what are you still doing this for? For example, telling the reader what to think and feel, making value judgments on characters, and ruining the surprise of future events, with lines like, the stupid woman foolishly started down the icy stoop without looking and immediately had a hard fall. Like, yeah, genius. Like, if, if you show someone, like, walking on ice or into a dangerous situation, yeah, no, duh, something bad is going to happen. Don't just tell us it's going to happen. That's like acting like we're stupid and can't figure it out or another one. Little did John realize his father was waiting behind the door and about to beat him black and blue for staying out five minutes late or... As Amy looked through the bridal magazine, she had no way of knowing she'd someday die in a car accident on the way to her wedding and would never have the experience of being a bride. So you know, if this is a series, you just like ruined what's going to happen to this character in like five, ten books or whatever. That's just like so obnoxious. I, like, why was God mode ever a thing? And I, I only did that because I just like, didn't know any better. I was just reading all these old books and copied, innocently copied what I saw. Number three. Have you ever been annoyed by what you discovered in a little free library, a book sale, or used bookstore? Tell us what you found and why it was so annoying. I always flip through used books to see if there's writing in them before I buy or take them for free, though I can't check every page. I've passed on buying some books because I discovered they were rendered in terrible formatting, like a 700-ish page book condensed into 125 pages thanks to a ridiculously large trim size like let's say like 8 by 11 which is the standard on printer paper size almost no margins on any side tiny print and a tiny um typeface and excessively tight um letting and kerning does anyone actually read those books i understand a lot of these are like public domain and people are just trying to make a quick buck with facsimiles and stuff but and they're just Oh, oh, I know it's a saga, but I'm going to just, you know, scrimp on the costs of production and make more money with people buying more copies by just like shrinking it down. That's just like so freaking obnoxious. And if you don't know, like um, letting refers to the space between the pages this is another mistake. It, it wasn't really too bad. I made with one of my own books formatting. I accidentally set the letting to um, 0.9 instead of 1. So that's not really like that much of a difference between like the regular like one point letting you find in um, a normal published 
book, but you know, I'm not going to make that mistake again. And this is just um, the regular one point letting. Again, I made the mistake with the margin size, but you know, it's not too bad. And I did um, correct it when I put out the second edition, including the um, hard cover edition. And kerning is how much um, space is between the letters. So like, for example, you don't want to have really like goofy, awkward spaces between words. Sometimes you have to like um, shrink up the kerning a little bit to make it a fit more like natural looking on a page. So, uh, uh, but I do have a future video planned about like formatting for both readers and writers. I just um need to get my hands on some screen and screen software so I can like, you know, show myself uh, d demonstrating it on the like the computer page for the document while I am talking about it as well. Number four. When it comes to short story collections, are you annoyed if there's a novella in the middle of the collection? Not if it's a great novella. In autumn 98, I read a Chekhov story collection containing one of his longest works, The Duel, from 1891, which immediately became one of my favoritest of his stories. It's so hilarious and memorable, and I particularly loved the deacon. Oh, he was so funny, like the, the, when there's the duel, like, a, oh, you'll kill him, cried the deacon, and there's... This one guy has a, like a creepy, weird, like unexpected laughing fit at a party and these, the children at the party are handing out notes like, oh, you have a big nose. And suddenly he's like, ha, 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 he catched it. And everyone is looking at this weirdo, just like laughing out of nowhere for no reason. Like who doesn't know that one person who is always like awkwardly laughing or like fake laughing and all the characters were so fun. And I do not share some people's view that the ending is disappointing. Like I actually love the ending of that book. It's, I highly recommend Chekhov. He's my um third favorite writer. I've loved him since I was like barely um, 16 years old. I, I should really do some more um, videos on um, Russian literature. Number five, deckled edges, beautiful or annoying. Gorgeous. They evoke a time long ago and worlds apart. And the phrase long ago and worlds apart, that's one of the Easter eggs I put in just about all of my own books. It's a quote from a Small Faces song. I just, you know, love that line so much. Number six, other people's annotations in a used book or library book. Annoying, or are you okay with it? I only write in a book to add someone's death date or other, ne or other necessary information. Thus, it makes my eyes twitch when I see all kinds of writing and underlining in a used book. I can't shake my early training that writing in a book when not absolutely necessary is defacing it. Something disreputable people do, you know, like the, oh, the bad kids at school write in books, but you don't because you're like a good kid who actually enjoys school. I went to get another copy of the Derling Martinez Purgatorio for this um, very reason. This was like a 10-ish um, dollars. I really enjoyed this translation and all the wonderful notes and essays, but I was just so disappointed when I was like going through this and seeing whoever owned it before me was like underlining and writing notes in the margin. Like seriously, why do you need to, I just don't understand underlining things in a book if you like something or putting like brackets around it. If you genuinely like something so much, why don't you just write that down in a notebook or do like a typed up computer document instead of defacing the book, particularly if you think or know you're going to be selling it after you finish taking a class or if you just are not jiving with the book and you decide you're, you know, going to sell it after you finish reading it. But don't just like, you know, runk it up for the next person who buys it. Like, what do I need? Like these random lines underlined. I have no idea why this person even wanted to, you know, underline these words. So no, no. And for the last time, no. And when people annotate books with adult language, that also runs the risk of exposing a young audience to certain words and concepts before they're ready. Like this is a kind of a little, it's not really like, you know, an R-rated story, but it's just, I found out what the word castrated means because two people had written in this um book I got out from the library when I was 13. It was like, I think a rolling stone, like album review guide. And this person had written next to one album, I'd rather be castrated. And then you see another person's handwriting. Yeah, I totally agree. And so when I was writing down a list of like stuff I wanted for my like birthday or holiday holiday stuff later that year I was writing down some albums and I wrote in parentheses after one I would would have not preferred not at the top of the list even if I'd rather be castrated my parents were like do you know what that word means like that's only something that can happen to biological males like seriously that's just you, why are you writing adult words in books when you know younger people might see those words that's just like, like uh, totally wrong and inappropriate Number seven, if there's a series or a collection of certain kinds of books, like an imprint, and changes are made, are you annoyed or okay with it? If yes, give us an example. 
I'm not a fan of retconning unless it's something fairly minor and changed very early on in the series, for example, slightly changing the age of a secondary character who is, you know, has no bearing on the actual, like, main characters um, or, or the storyline. It's just, like, something the person, like, changed for whatever reason. It's one thing to put out a new edition with some new material added and some revisions made, as I have done with just about all of my own books for various reasons, but entirely another to radically change the story itself. Like, if you're, like, not sure about something, just, like, don't publish the book or make it, you know, like, ambiguous instead of, oh, these characters are this age, or but suddenly they're, like, much younger, or much older in another book. So just, like, you know, sit it on the back burner and keep thinking instead of actually, like, retconning the book. Just, like, seriously, no. Number eight. Do the decisions of characters in a novel ever annoy you? Share the book and what decisions you found annoying. A lot of people who rant about characters' decisions don't seem to understand the book would be completely different, probably wouldn't even have much of a story if characters made on different decisions, as you might have seen my recent comprehensive video discussing and reviewing the classic um, Kathleen Windsor historical romance novel Forever Amber. Like Some people who give this book negative reviews there read, oh, Amber isn't a very good person and Bruce is even worse. That's uh, They're not meant to be like lovey-dovey, sympathetic, like completely moral characters. And yeah, Amber would have had a much like easier life if she had settled down with Captain Rex Morgan and stopped chasing after Bruce. And like, and if Bruce had real, put his foot down and said, look, Amber, I am I'm attached to you because we have a two children together and I will always have love for you at some level, but you're just not the type of woman I want to marry. Yeah, it would have been completely different, but then the story pretty much, there's no story like Amber lives happily ever after and th then the story is ending. There's no more drama with like the king or any of her future husbands or lovers or any of these other like secondary real historical characters. So just like a lot of people, they just don't understand. Yeah, me, it's okay for you not to like something in a book, but the author obviously saw it a completely different way and it wouldn't be the same story at all anymore if it ran according to what like, you wanted. That was also similar to what this um, nasty troll who gave me like a novella length, like no paragraph break rant on Goodreads like, oh, why didn't you write it like this and match up these characters and do this and do that? Uh, because that's how I deliberately chose to structure the book. So it would have actual like original angle and dramatic tension and not just be the same old, same old. But, you know, some people just don't get that. It goes without saying that all of Beatrice Sparks's characters, I've had a number of videos ranting about her books that have a whole bunch of plan for the future. They make really stupid decisions and she deprives them of any moral agency and free will by having them only get into these situations because bad people tricked them, took advantage of them, etc. Like she's trying to say, oh, a good teenager would absolutely never voluntarily have like premarital sex or experiment with drugs or like disobey parents that could only be because people were like taking advantage of them and just she makes her characters sound like stupid toddlers like for example why is 14 year old Nancy not understanding this dude in his like mid 20s upper 30s is why doesn't she not understand he's lying about his age like why is she sneaking around dating a legal adult man anyway why is she bringing him over to her apartment when her like, mother is out of town. Like, what did she think? I mean, obviously, of course, I'm not, bla well, she's not a real person anyway, but I'm not, like, what do you think might happen when you get in, you at 14 years old, get involved with a legal adult man and, like, bring him around? Like, do you think, like, he's going to, like, treat you? Like, I, I just, I, I, so many, her characters make so many stupid decisions of like treacherous love with Jenny does she genuinely not understand it's like creepy for her teacher to like make inappropriate advances of her like have her living with him like taking creepy pictures of her looking like a little girl or all these other characters say oh I would never do that voluntarily it has to be because someone took advantage of me just oh you I have so many rants coming about this woman and her terrible books and I do need to make a playlist of the um, videos that I have done already like ripping apart her absolute garbage. I also hate when a major storyline or subplot is about an affair yet we never get any real sense of just why these people would decide to leave an existing relationship or cheat. We're just expected to take it at face value that they're unhappy in the present relationship 
even more annoying when there's not much chemistry between the illicit lovers and we don't even get a sense was it worth it like for example Anna Karenina and um Tender as Night like oh I have um I'm going to be doing a future video about Tender as Night based on a blog post I wrote let's just say the main character Dick he kind of lives up to his name like why is he, I he, he was horrible I could not root for him at any point and why is he like abandoning his poor wife Nicole who is like a lot of like mental health issues and their two children to like chase after an 18 year old and oh I just hated that this character so much I felt bad for Nicole I did not feel bad for Dick at all like why are we supposed to be rooting for this absolute dirt bag number nine are you ever annoyed by how someone organizes their books what do you find annoying I'm not a fan of organizing books by color especially when they're often wildly disparate like scholarly nonfiction, quick beach reads and sci-fi Organizing by page count also seems goofy and nitpicky, even for me, like when I was still in my own home back home in Albany, New York, I uh, did a lot of books by, you know, subject, for example, like Holocaust um, memoirs and nonfiction, like Russian historical nonfiction, like Russian writers, um, foreign language, um, dictionaries and instruction books, um, Herman Hesse, um, Alexander Isayevich, um, Solzhenitsyn, who are my um, two um, favorite writers like Turgenev just uh, things like that but I was never doing a particular scheme beyond like subject matter and authors uh, but you know do whatever floats your boat number 10 share something bookish you find annoying I hate floating timelines for example the babysitters club series and timelines where characters age normally as time alternately stands still and passes faster than they're aging them Phyllis um, Reynolds um, Naylor series Alice it was at like a reverse um, timeline and I have it right up here this um, blog post I wrote on the final book in the series now I'll tell you everything which I do plan to make into a video at some point so I just don't like the timeline like pa time passing style she chose so the the first book was published in 1985 and the finale was in 2013 a sixth grader of 1985 would not be texting and using Facebook when heading off to college six years later. The time capsule, which is um, opened when Alice and her classmates are 60 years old, also has a newspaper with headlines about the USSR. Like, make up your mind about when this series is supposed to be set. Oh, I had so many issues with that book. It was like the, the how not to end a classic long-running series. Another thing is when a series that started with middle-grade-aged characters remains at a middle-grade level, even after the characters age into YA, I'm for, I'm specifically thinking about um, Ella of All of a Kind Family by Sidney Taylor. The average middle grade reader probably isn't interested in reading about an 18 year old thinking about marriage, while actual 18 year olds probably don't want to read a book written at a fifth grade level. I'm so glad that style seems to have kind of like hit the wayside by this um, point in history. I also hate updating classic youth um, literature for a new generation. I have a whole video about that, like, for example, uh, Judy Bloom's books and the Babysitter's Club's book, because, oh, no, God forbid kids these days not know what a VCR is or a cassette player or who this um, reference to a famous movie star or TV show is. Oh, so we have to pretend they're modern books and write in contemporary references. Well, that kind of, like, ruins what the book is all about there. Yeah, they have dated because of all these topical references, but that just mean, makes them a, you know, a time capsule of the 70s and 80s. It's like intellectually dishonest to pretend they're like really modern books. And I also hate um, predated names. And th this happens in like books and TV shows and um, movies. And it's just like stupid. I'm a name nerd. So these some things stick out to me. Of course, there are plenty of names that are popular now or popular like a few generations ago that have existed for a long time even before they were like super trendy or like hearing them everywhere but there are some names that just didn't exist or they like were only used on like nails at a certain point like for example I'm totally going to r roll my eyes at a, a 17th century um woman named like Madison or like Ashley or Mackenzie or something like that or just like a man named like Jade and Braden Kate and Aiden and whatever in like the 1920s so that's just like like use names that actually would have like existed at the time your characters were born or at, na at least names you know like popular names p names people knew about and said oh this name is pr trendy and I like it now and I'm not even gonna look into whether it actually even existed or was like widely used by more than like a handful of like extremely like weird like our academic esoteric scholars a hundred years ago and I, I know a lot of people have already done this um, tag already. I guess if you guys haven't done it already, um, feel free to do it. I never really am sure who to 
tag because I ne- don't yet have like a like a guaranteed audience. So I know all these like five, ten people will always comment in, on my videos, and I don't want to weird people out by tagging them when we're not you know, like mutual friends. But I guess like you live and learn as you like go through more of your channel journey. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please um consider leaving a comment. I'd love to have um conversations with you guys, even though I've been like really preoccupied with my um writing um commitments during the, these um past few months. And uh, thanks again for watching. I will see you again very soon. Bye.